Good evening, Judge Fisher. Good evening, um, Acting Chief Justice. How are you this evening? I'm fine, thank you. Are I hope you... everybody else as well. I know it's been a very long day. Are you not angry with us that we have uh, kept you waiting for so long? Not at all. Oh, thank you. We apologize. And even if I were, I wouldn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the right time. <laughs> okay, all right. We are going to start. Um, uh, Judge Fisher, I see that your academic qualifications are BA and LLB. Is that correct? That's correct. You got your BA in 1985 at Vets, is that right? That's correct. And you got your LLB in, at the same university in 1998. 1988. 88. Oh, why, why, do I, why did I think I saw 1988? <laughs> Because, okay, 1988, anyway. Yes, you've that's just the taken current. 10 years off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe you you went to work somewhere and then no. <laughs> went back to <laughs> study. And you were admitted uh, in December 1999 as an advocate, is that right? That's right. And you practiced as an advocate until January 2017. That's right. Uh, that's a period of about, what, 18 years? Um. 20, 20, or 19? 27. I was at the bar for 27 oh, years. Oh, I was at the bar for 27 years, and I've been on the bench for five. Um, is it 1989 or 19? 89. 89. Oh, I've got 1999. Okay. So that, that's quite a long time. It is a long time. Yes, yes. And then you have been a judge now for how long? Um, for five years. For five years. Okay, thank you. And that is in the Johannesburg High Court? Yes. Yes. While you were practicing as an advocate, did you do a lot of competition matters or you only got to do those after you came onto the bench? I did one or two. Yes. Um, it was always a, an area of the law that interested me. But the nature of competition law is such that it's often the captains of industry that are determining who they want in their, in their corner. Mm. And at the time when I was at the bar um, and going forward, uh, uh, women were not given a lot of opportunities mm. to, the, to do that kind of work. I did two matters, but um, I certainly can't say that I have um, practice experience mm -hmm. in, in competition mm -hmm. um, law. And when did you act for the first time in the competition of your court? I've been acting, I've been, I'm still acting, yes. and I've been acting for two years, nearly two years. Is that two years at a stretch? Or? At a stretch, yes. Oh, that, that must um, give you a lot of experience. It has given, you, you know, the unfortunate thing is that um, there haven't been, um, the, the, the commission has been concentrating on mergers to a very large extent. So there's a backlog as far as competition cases proper are concerned. So I've sat in four cases, four very interesting cases, and I've written two judgments. Uh, uh. Okay, so you mean you have sat in four cases over the two years? Four cases over the two years, yes. And I've, I've got another one coming up in October, this, um, um, coming up this month. But uh, if there's a backlog, how, how do you sit in four cases over two years if there's a backlog? Because the, the Competition Commission and the Tribunal have been um, focusing on mergers and with COVID there's also been an impact there, but not a lot of the competition um, cases. So you mean there, there's a, a backlog at the level of the com commission and the tribunal, not at the level of the 
competition appeal court. Yes, not at the level of the competition appeal so court. So at the level of the competition appeal court, there is no backlog. No. But the, that court is not receiving cases because of other challenges with the commission or tribunal or both. That's exactly right. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I wasn't being clear. Okay, yes. no, no, no. That, that's, um, that's but, fine. but not a lot of cases are running. Yes. And what and you'll see that it's a it's a bench that has been much depleted, mm. particularly of late. Mm. We've um, we've lost um, Jerome and Guni and mm. I get quite emotional talking about it. He was a he, he was a wonderful um, presence mm. on the court and a great educator. Mm. Mm. And um, we now are left with three permanent positions, three, oh. three, three sitting judges, oh. um, which, um, which is shy of what is needed oh. 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 significantly. Oh. Now, uh, if you say you have acted for two years, that would mean you started maybe towards the end of 2019? 2019, um, and I'm coming up in October for my second year. Oh, um, okay. In, in, in this month for my second year. Okay. Do you enjoy competition law? I really, really enjoy it. Yes. I find it, you have to. Mm. You have to because it's hard law mm. um, and challenging law. Mm. And it's law. Um, which I find fascinating because of the economic um, component. Mm -hmm. And because... Well, I was about to say, isn't the position that uh, there is economics involved in it as well? Yes. Oh. And that makes it all the more fascinating because it's as if one has one's finger on the pulse of how the economy is operating in the various industries because there's, there's a lot of cloak and dagger as well. Um, so it's an interesting factual inquiry that has to be undertaken. And um, as I say, you've got to love it because I come from a very, very busy bench and it's not a court that sits in, in its own time and gives you any reading or any extra resources. You have to fit in your, your, your competition appeal court um, duties um, in with your, your normal role. So we try to sit on a Friday. The records are very long, generally. So it, it takes a lot of reading. And um, as a busy judge in one of the busiest divisions in the country, um, it's got to be a labor, a labor of love. Um, you've got to love it to do it. The judgments that you have uh, written on competition law, uh, what important topics of competition law do they cover? Measures or um, the, dominance abuse? The one that I... Um, the one that I wrote, that I, even though I was reversed by the Concord, uh, I'm very proud of it. Uh, it was um, it was the Competition Commission versus Beef Corps, uh, um, and it was concurred in by um, by Judge Rogers and Judge Nguni, uh, and. Um, the judgment serves, I believe, to, to reflect my grasp of competition law. It dealt with, a, with an interpretation of a section, oh. section um, 67.3, and it was an important, an important judgment. Oh. And um, if you read it, you'll see I've worked very hard on it, and it does display um, a, a sense of how the commission works, how the tribunal works, um, and um, whether when one, uh, when, when the, the point was um, whether the, um, if the, the commission withdrew a matter, 
whether that was a, uh, a kind of outrequoise a quit convict situation mm, whether they or whether they or... were allowed to go back. Yeah. Um, I thought, I, I focused very heavily on a human rights um, perspective mm. and I said no, but the Concord wanted to, to mm. let the, um, the, the commission in and didn't want to limit their, um, their involvement to the extent that my judgment did and that's, that's probably a good thing. No, that, that's fine, that's fine. Thank you very much. Judge Victor, I now give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions to the candidates. Thank you, Thank Acting you. Chief Justice. Good evening, Judge Fisher. Hello, Judge Victor. In your introductory mm. remarks, you said that um, it was difficult for women at the bar to get competition work. You've been in law for th about 30 years or more. Mm. Um, have uh, things I'm, I'm changed? Sorry, I'm sorry, Judge Victor. I'm terribly sorry to do this to you. Shall I go closer? But I just think, no, no, no. I think I must share something with you before you proceed. In the interviews that we did today, we had set aside 20 minutes per candidate. Mm -hmm. So I just mentioned so that you have an idea. Yes. And that is, it was with everybody's questions, but you are representing the head of the court, yes. so you you can uh, ask questions and yes. satisfy yourself. Thank you, Acting mm. Chief Justice. So we'll, we'll just be brief. Um, it doesn't seem to oh. me that much has changed. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've said something that's wrong. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's true. It's not, it was not 20 minutes, it was 40 minutes that we set aside right. for the candidate and limited commissioners to two to, to questions, but the head of the court who could ask uh, more questions. I'll, I'll yeah. limit it to three questions. The, the well, just satisfy yourself that yes. you have asked all the important questions. Right. Yeah. Um, why is it that women are left out? And is there something that the Minister of Justice can do to get more women involved in the specialist courts? Because there's a paucity of women in the specialist courts including the competition that people call. Yes, I, 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 I think I think you must just speak into the microphone. That is, a, that is a symptom of what has been happening in the past. It's not only women. Um, it's also black practitioners. But um, I think, as I said, the, the, the competition um, arena is about dominance. It's about dominant firms and... Um, dominant directors wanting what they think will be a council who will dominate. And very often, um, women are not thought to be in that category. Right. And I think that's where the, um, the inequality has, has come in. So are you, uh, are you saying that there has to be an active um, a focus on getting more women involved in specialist courts. It's the only way. It's the right. only way that it can be done. Right, so I'll move on. Um, what is South African uh, competition law, the response to COVID? I'm thinking of the Babalegi case. I'm thinking of DISCIM. What do you think the response has been uh, in competition law to the COVID uh, pandemic? Well, I, I, I think the Diskin case um, was indicative of the fact that the consumer was at the center of... I think you've got to speak into the I'm sorry. I think it was the acting chief Forgive me. Um, the consumer, it was, it's very consumer driven. I think that's what, what I get out of, out of those cases. Um, the, the, the fact is that... Um, these, these are essential products, and the fact that they are, that, that there's a, um, an exploit, exploitation factor so very, is something that came, came yes. across very strongly in both judgments. And that judgments. is price gouging. Price gouging. Right. Um, and, and basically keeping, um, keeping the, the, the con consumer away from the benefits of a competitive environment yes. um, just in, 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 at a time 
when the 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 sort of well, it was masks in dis, in Diskim, with, with with that kind of crucial equipment. Just remember, Judge Fisher, that you are addressing all the yes, commissioners. Yes, so I yes. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Um, yes. So so the, the the price gouging and the and the protective aspect. Um, from my my perspective, I think that um, I enjoy competition law um, as much as I do because of the the particular in a, uh, economic um, position from a South African perspective in relation to the writing of the um, the past um, inequalities it's it, it's almost an opportunity um, for a different kind of redistribution, um, in, in, uh, as I see it. Thank you, Judge Fisher. I can I ask you one last question, Acting Chief Justice? Um, do you see the need for the greater infusion of the constitution or constitutional jurisprudence in competition law? Well, I, I, I think um, of late there's been... Um, there's been a, a, a movement into that realm. It seems as though everything, um, if, if, if every matter um, which is of any significance from a competition perspective, um, one always thinks, well, it's going to Bramfontein now. And I think the competition, the the um, the constitution, is um, is is playing a a, a very significant significant role. Um, it's it's recently um, um, determined the, the the question of of, of the, the the time bar issue as opposed to prescription, and that was also a sixty seven um, um, interpretation matter. So I do think it's playing um, a a large role more and more in 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 competition. Thank you. Thank you. I think Chief Justice. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Malema. No, thank you, uh, Acting Chief Justice. I heard you, the Chief Justice, asked you about some judgment which you, you said was reversed and you are very proud of it. Um, so, what is the point of the judgment being reversed and still being proud of it? Because I thought when it is reversed, it means you are being corrected and they show you where you made mistakes and all of that. Mr. Malema, it's not that simple because in this particular... Uh, please bring your mic closer to your judgment. In this particular, yeah. in this particular matter, there was an ambiguity in the section. So it was a question of saying, well, it's got two meanings. Um, and the judgment um, was, was um, concurred in by two very experienced judges who sat with me. And they believed my interpretation to be a proper interpretation. So it doesn't necessarily mean when one is reversed that one hasn't done the work and one doesn't have the understanding of the principles. It just means that you've, you've chosen one of two options and that's what the Constitutional Court did. Um, I looked at both of the options. I examined both of them and I think I did a very good job of examining both of them. But I'm, I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer. Being reversed doesn't mean your judgment is wrong. Is that not what they're saying, that your judgment is wrong? Is that what it means? It can mean that although you have examined the various principles um, in the case, dealing with the interpretation, dealing with the, the, the competition um, principles, it can mean that you opted for an interpretation which was not in accordance with the interpretation that the Constitutional Court 
um, opted for. So I suppose in simple language, it means the, competition, the, the, the Constitutional Court is saying, yes, the Competition Court opted for the wrong um, interpretation. It so, doesn't mean that that interpretation wasn't necessarily a viable interpretation. Um, so it's, it's not as if one's got the law wrong. It's, it's a question of saying, which of the two interpretations serves the Constitution best? No, DCJ, the, the point is when you get, when, he, when a matter is appealed to the higher court, you are either affirmed you are right or you are wrong. Because I don't want to leave here a judge with an impression that you are being arrogant when you are being corrected by the higher court which says to you, you were wrong, and uh, this is how the matter should have been resolved. Because it can't be that you are reversed, but you are right. No, that's not what I'm saying, Mr. Milliman. I think it's my fault. I don't think I've been very clear. Um, what I'm saying is that I'm proud of the judgment because of the reasoning in it. And because the reasoning was not thrown out by the Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court accepted that there were two viable interpretations in the same way that I did. But they said that the Competition Appeal Court, the Competition Appeal Bench, had opted for the interpretation which they did not approve. So in, in simple terms, they said, yes, you're wrong. But you, you can be wrong and you can still be proud of your reasoning in a judgment. Um, it was the first judgment that I wrote in the competition court. And I worked very hard on it. And I'm not being arrogant. I, I, I'm not saying the constitutional court was wrong. But I'm saying that I didn't, um, that, that I, wrote, I wrote a judgment that, that was viable from various perspectives. Judge, you cannot be proud of a wrong judgment that gets overruled by the Constitutional Court because then it is you are suggesting the judgment of the Constitutional Court is not worth the paper written on. Because as a judge of a lower court, when being corrected by a higher court like the Constitutional Court, you should be able to say, well, I accept, I've learned from that, and... Uh, and move forward because I live here with an understanding that you can be proud of being wrong as a judge because that's the impression I'm getting that I understand you have put all types of work in it you have done all manner of reasoning you have done all manner of uh, research and all of that but the higher court said you are wrong and you cannot continue to say a Judgment that is overturned by the highest court in the land, you are proud of it. Because it means, in a way, indirectly you are still arguing that actually the constitutional court is wrong. You are right. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, let, let's take another example. Say, say for example, you... Um, say, say, for example, you um, dissent in a judgment. And that court, um, the, the majority of that court says, no, this is the way forward. If you've written a dissenting judgment, you can still be proud of it, even though it is not the judgment of the court. So you can say, I, I've dissented, I don't agree, but... Um, and I'm proud of the way I reasoned it. It doesn't mean that the law is not the law. You were not dissenting. You are not even at an equal level to dissent. You were overturned. Your judgment was reversed. It's not the same. You ought to accept that your judgment was wrong. The constitutional court reversed your judgment. And to say that you are proud of it and even compare it to dissenting borders on arrogance. 
And Will so, I be wrong? Because that's what I'm going to take in the deliberations. Will I be wrong to take that direction? Look, I, I'm not an arrogant person, Mr. Malema. And what I'm expressing is not arrogance on the basis that I'm saying, well, the Constitutional Court was wrong and I was right. I accept that the Constitutional Court is right. Obviously, I do. Obviously. And I accept that my judgment has been overturned. But the manner in which I reasoned it um, dealt with the two options that could be adopted in the interpretation. And um, I'm not, I think I dealt well with those two options. The fact that I chose the wrong one doesn't mean that I didn't work, work through the matter um, in, a, in a sensible, reasoned fashion. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, TC. Thank you, Commissioner Malema. And then Commissioner Dodovu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Chief Justice. Good evening, Judge Fisher. Good evening. Good. Uh, I'm going to test your knowledge or your understanding on the principles of natural justice and the audial term paratem rule. The reason I'm doing that is because three of the objections against your appointment borders on those principles. Yes. In the case of Taylor versus Raff and another matter, they say you committed a travesty of justice, you didn't apply the rules of natural justice in whatever that you were doing, and the audial term paratem rule was never observed as well. Yes. Now, I want to test your understanding of those principles. Can you just share with us very few underpinnings of, of those principles? What underpins natural justice and audial terrain Um <clears throat> I think I'd like to do that in the context of Taylor, if you'll allow me to. Um, because Taylor has been a judgment that um, it's been called seminal. It's a judgment that reflects, I think, what the, um, what the courts are, fa are, are facing in the RAF um, arena. The attorneys concerned felt very aggrieved. The aggrievement, I do not believe, had anything to do with the fact that they were not properly heard. They were properly heard. The way the matter played out was as follows. And I think I must take a few steps back because the RAF environment for the last Two, two years or so, has been very fraught with, um, with difficulty in the form of practitioners not, um, not adhering to their, um, their ethical considerations to the court. What has occurred as a result is that the leader of, of, of our court, J.P. Malambo, um, together with other, um, other people um, from a committee perspective, they drew up a, a very intricate directive in order to stop the the rot, so to speak, because what was happening, and I'm sure you, you, you'll, you'll remember a few years back, a number of counsel were struck off the roll because they were, ch they were charging five, um, five day fees um, in one day because they were just settling the matter. And settlement has become the, the order of the day. So um, also the obtaining of a trial date is something that 
practitioners would obtain and then they would um, then they would settle on the day and they would charge their, their, their trial um, fee. So the RAF environment is an industry and judges are faced with it on a daily basis. Now, With the greatest respect, you are not answering my question. And if you are going to follow this line, we are going to stay here until in the early hours of the morning. My question is, share with this commission your understanding of the principles of natural justice, not referring to this specific case, because this is not the only case. There are other cases where a concern is raised about how you interpret and understand the principles of natural justice. Share with us, tell us, if we talk about natural justice and its baby, Audi Altera, this is what we're looking at. These are the key principles, not specifically telling us what happened in that particular specific case. The first principle of Audi Alter and Partum, and I see that as the most important role of a judge, is to listen. To listen, not only to listen, but to hear. So, from, from an Audi Alter and Partum um, point of view, fairness means that you must listen, and the people that you are hearing must, give, must be given a full opportunity to ventilate whatever concerns they may have and to put their case before you as a judge. And I take Audi Alter and Partum very seriously. In this case that you wanted to share information about, the, the Taylor case, Yes. what was the outcome of the Concord? Did it overturn no. your judgment, or what was the outcome? No, of the there's been there's been no overturning. It was never overturned. No. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Acting. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Dodovo, Commissioner Madonsela. Good evening. Uh, can you just enlighten me what, in your understanding, is the overall objective of governmental intervention through competition laws in market regulation? Well, it's to cre create a fair environment, um, particularly in relation to abuse of dominance, um, to, keep, um, to keep competition alive, to stop big firms um, being predatory in relation to, form, um, to, to, to smaller firms and keeping them out of the marketplace. Um, because in that way, they reduce competition in, in, in the marketplace. Is that regulation effective in your assessment? Um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Is the legislation, the Competition Act, and the laws around it effective in achieving that objective I think, in your assessment? I think it is effective. It makes the point that it wants to regress in balance. Uh, please speak up a bit. Uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. It makes the point that it wants to redress imbalance, and specifically the imbalances of apartheid. Um, and I think the Constitutional Court has been very cautious to, um, to apply that aspect in relation to abuse of dominance, um, the, 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 the price gouging, the, the, the fact that consumers are affected and smaller businesses are affected when dominance is, is, allowed, to, is allowed to be exploited. Um, so I, I, I think that it, it, it does, it, it has done a good work. I, th work. I think it is effective, um, but I think it's a question of how one applies the, 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 the laws. Um, just speaking um, of the interpretation of, of Section um, 
67.3, which was the, the judgment that I wrote, um, and six, section 67.1. That has come out in the Constitutional Court um, as a, a movement towards strengthening the Commission's powers rather than detracting from them. So um, when one's looking at cartel activity, it can be very difficult to, to determine um, because it's all done um, and, and under, undercover. That's the nature of the cartel, um, of the cartel um, practice. So it's, um, it's important that the, the, the commission has significant powers. And if one looks at, at the various constitutional pr pronouncements on, um, on the commission's powers, it, it has, from an interpretive point of view, um, it's erred in favor of giving the comp competition um, the Competition Commission more power because it understands that that's the way it, um, it, it reduces um, the, the, um, the abuse of dominance and the keeping of smaller businesses out of, out of the marketplaces. And um, so I think together with the, uh, what the Constitution is, is, is doing from its, in, its interpretation perspective, um, and the letter of the act, I think it's working. Uh, as a follow-up, just, uh, just one last thing. Okay. Uh, the market in South Africa is skewed uh, in favor of uh, the big capital uh, enterprises. Yes. Uh, seems to me that with that in mind, the composition or oh, that white those white enterprises are predominantly white. Yes, they are. Uh, big enterprises are. Yes. It seems to me that the composition of the court uh, currently is uh, such that it is. Uh, the, I'm talking about the appeal court, competition appeal court. It simply has no African representative at all. Well, with with the with the death of um, of. of um, Judge Nguni, um, that has um, fallen away. But um, Judge Bakwana is a loss to our court, but she's again to the um, the Supreme Court of Appeal. So um, there were those two um, two heads on the court. I'm talking. I'm talking currently now. No. Uh, am I wrong about that? Was I, I was I was, trying, I was trying to look around to see who are the judges of that court currently. And it seems to me there's not a single African. Uh, not anymore. They, 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 they were some um, some months ago. They were um, Jerome Nguni was was one of them, and he was going to to come before this commission. And I think he would have been a wonderful leader of the court. Um, and Judge Bakwana, who's now been ele um, elevated to the um, the SCA, was also a, a main player, and. Um, and has written some very good judgments, one of the most important judgments um, to come out recently. But there are no, there are no black practitioners um, on, on, on the court. There are, only three, there are only three permanent judges that remain. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, shouldn't we, on, on that reckoning, should we not wait a little bit and try and get some other candidates in the, in the market, maybe freeze one position? Would that be a fair suggestion, or do you think otherwise? I don't think it's a question of freezing a position. Um, oh, sorry, that's for, for the template, no, freezing. No, no, I know what you mean. Sort of keeping one aside. No, no, no not feeling it, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry, Judge. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I, I didn't mean freezing the position. I mean not feeling it. Oh, uh, not feeling it, yes. No, I understand. I understand what you, what, what you propose. Um, and I don't think in this instance it will serve any purpose because the court is so depleted because of the manner in which things have played out that um, there, are, there are places for, for, for people, good people, who, um, 
who can do good work and are energetic, um, there are more places that will, will become available. You can't have an appeal court with only three practitioners. And there needs to be leadership as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tsepe. Thank you, thank you, Acting Chief Justice. Good evening, Justice Fisher. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. I, I have um, one question, but um, it relates. It, it will it will cover a component of your answer to uh, uh, to the Chief Justice when um, he when the Chief Justice was was talking to you, and it basically relates to the the obligation in, in Section 39.2 of the Constitution about um, the court being um, uh, required uh, uh, when interpreting any legislation, including the Competition yes. Act, um, uh, to promote the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. I wanted to find out from you, in your experience, do you think a specialist court like the Competition Appeal Court um, has met this, this obligation in, in, its, in its functioning, and if you have any examples that you could uh, you could share with us in that regard, um, and and just as an uh, added part to to that is the you said you had written two judgments in the competition appeal court. If you could just uh, discuss the other judgment, uh, uh, it wasn't in the. It wasn't in your, in, your, in, your, in your application. The other judgment was a dissenting judgment. Um, so I dissented um, on, on, on the court because I disagreed with the, um, the approach taken in the matter. Um, so, so if I can just start from, um, from, from your last question. Um, it, it was a dissenting judgment. Sorry, uh, Chief Justice, uh, Acting Chief Justice, if you don't mind, Justice Fisher, if, if you don't mind just discussing briefly uh, 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 that judgment, the, yes. the dissenting judgment. Yes, um, that was a matter where the tribunal had um, written a, uh, a judgment that was somewhat problematic. And I think all counsel agreed that it had to be put right um, in the sense that the, um, there were certain findings made in the, um, in, in, by the tribunal in its um, decision, which I don't want to get overly technical, but which stopped the, the, the matter progressing um, any further because um, it, 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 it put paid, issues had been decided, which put paid to the appeal principles, which were, um, were going to ultimately be decided. Um, so the, um, the argument was that one should um, strike out parts of the judgment and um, passages in the judgment. And I had a difficulty with that because of Neotel um, and the, um, the other judgments in the SCA, which say you can't, you can't appeal findings in the judgment. You can only appeal an order. So um, the, 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 the court, um, um, Judge Valley wrote the judgment. And um, I said to him, I wasn't comfortable with the fact that the judgment was to the effect that certain parts of the judgment, the, the, the judgment be struck out. I believe that there was a, there was a better way of dealing directly with the order. And um, I believed that we were precluded um, by the authorities in the SCA from, um, from adjusting the, the, the findings in the judgment itself. Um, his, his approach was, uh, he wrote the judgment and he said um, he believed that it could be done because we're a, we're, we're a parallel court, um, which I, I don't necessarily agree with. 
Um, but even if that were so, um, I'm certainly, I don't, I, I, I don't feel that I could ever be bold enough to go against um, to, uh, um, SCA authority in, 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 in the Constitutional Appeal Court. And if I did, I would certainly have to reason at some length as to why I believed that the judgment was wrong. And I, I, I don't believe the, the Neotel and, 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 and the, the judgments that follow are wrong. So, so that, that was why I dissented in, in, in that judgment. Um, it was an interim, it was an interim um, judgment um, which basically freed the road ahead to, um, to the appeal and took away impediments to the appeal process. Yes. So, um, and and the other one was the beef core matter, where I um, I highlighted the um, the right of people to to finality, and I I, I held that um, it's almost because of the criminal and civil nature of um, of the of competition proceedings. I highlighted the the criminal aspect and said, well, it's like a, 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 an autrefois convict and acquit. You, sh you, you, shouldn't, you, you, you shouldn't have to come back again when, um, when, when there's been a withdrawal. Um, but there was another, there was another um, um, interpretation, and I accept that that was the right interpretation. Thank you. Acting Chief Justice, I just wanted to 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 check, and and I know I'm I'm asking for a second a second question, but my my um, my asking of uh, the 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 last the question that you answered first was to try to understand in the matters that you would have heard before the CAC Justice Fisher. The, 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 whether you would have engaged with some of the substantive uh, components of competition law in some of the matters that would have come before you um, uh, in that period, given that you had only done four matters. Yes. So I was, I was trying to get uh, to see uh, just not just the, what would be procedural uh, uh, Components of the right of the of the act, but more on the substantive uh, 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 components. Yes, the, the the dissent was mainly a procedural of a procedural nature. You're quite correct. So I don't think that that's necessarily helpful from the perspective of of, of testing my competition um, um, experience. But but the reason that I raised beef call is because. It was a judgment that deals with those principles, and it deals with them fully. Um, and that's why um, I upset Mr. Mil Milhema by saying I was proud of it. I wasn't trying to say that I was right. I was trying to say that I engaged in, in a sensible way with competition principles. I understand. Thank you, Justice Fisher. Thank you, ACJ. Thank you. I'm going to go to Commissioner Nochesi, but before I do so, I just want to remind all of us that uh, I think we said we need to make sure that uh, the workers are able to leave at 11 and we still have another candidate. But when I say that, we must always remember that we mustn't compromise the job. We, we, we must make sure that we uh, we satisfy ourselves that whatever decision we, we take, we have uh, obtained all the relevant information that we need from the candidate. Uh, Commissioner, no, Jesse, we are at uh, 10 to 10. Or oh, quarter to, quarter to, yeah, 10. Well, day. <laughs> Uh, Chief Justice, the last answer actually answered the question that I was to answer. I was oh, to take. Thank you. You know, I always like those. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll, I'll put your name down. Let me go to. Uh, I'll put your name down. Uh, 
the next one, I think, Matolo uh, Sepu, you had your hand up at some stage, is that right, Commissioner? Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Chief Justice, and good evening, Judge. Good evening, Commissioner. You know, I'm still, I'm still a bit worried about the the objections raised against your conduct and and the language used in. Um, Oh, I'm still a bit worried about the objections raised, basically because it affects my profession and and the people I'm we are regulating, and it has caused so much discourse among the judges and the profession that we are trying to bridge that gap. I know, and definitely that is the RAF issue. You know, and and I still want to understand that shouldn't there have been a better way of dealing with it instead of it coming to this stage of having this really the discourse that it has against the judiciary and the practitioners. So do you think you were correct in in these adverse findings and how uh, for for me, I think you you generalize the adverse findings against the practitioners in general. That's how the the public views it. So how do we go to a stage where we bring the profession and the judiciary back into the the respect that they used to to have amongst themselves? Um. Are you suggesting that the Taylor judgment has in some way um, reflected poorly on the judiciary? I, I'm just trying to understand um, what that question means. Not necessarily the Taylor judgment. Actually, one of the objections is by Advocate Kennan, where he, she, she, he actually said the adverse findings against experts and legal professionals without evidence or a hearing it was actually a, I want to, the profession is unhappy about those statements that you made in those judgments. Do you think is there a way, because the, the, the public views practitioners as this, I must say it. And I'm one of the people who depended on the road accident fund work. And for the past 20 years, 26 years, and I was never branded a thief. So how, how, how do we get to a stage where we bring the profession back with the judiciary to be, you know, to be in unison, in understanding? I understand that you had to, to report these practitioners, but the public out there views practitioners as thieves. How do you think we can reverse that situation? I think that we can do that by, um, when you say we, a lot rests with the RAF. And on the basis that you, 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 you practice in, in that environment, you understand what certain practitioners do. So in this particular instance, the, um, I was unhappy with the settlement. Um, and I made no bones about the fact that I was unhappy because there was grave irregularity going on. Um, the, the practitioners then settled. Um, they settled for a substantial amount more than the original claim, which had not been amended and um, significantly inflated, in fact, by um, threefold. And I said, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not happy with, with this settlement. And they said, well, you don't have to be happy with the settlement because um, we've settled. And it doesn't matter that you're not happy with the settlement. Now, that's what judges in the high court that's the attitude that they face from some practitioners on a daily basis. They're told that they can have, once there's a settlement between the parties, they can have no, um, they can have no input. 
Now, that's just legally not correct. Because as you'll be aware, in terms of Section 4.1 of the Contingency Fees Act, the court is enjoined to have um, to, to look at every settlement where there's a contingency fee agreement. So it's, a, it, it's like a game of cat and mouse, because then you say, no, um, I'm told that I have to. The statute tells me that I must look at it, and I must be happy with it. And they say, um, no, we, we, ha we didn't enter into a contingency fee agreement with, with these clients. Now, we know that that would be a very unusual set of circumstances for an attorney not to enter into a contingency fee agreement um, with an indigent client and on the basis that that... Um, the contingency fee agreement gives gives the, the the attorney a lot more a lot more fees. So the question is, and it's a question that I posed over and over, because I heard this matter over three days. So to say I didn't hear the practitioners is absolutely false, because I adjourned. I allowed them to get senior counsel, um, and you will see that the judgment um, is a judgment that I wrote in an unopposed matter because I felt I had to show what was going on. So I say, why, why have you now say, said to me that this is not a contingency fee agreement? The only, the only reason is because they don't want judicial oversight. They don't have to tax the fees if it's not a contingency fee agreement. And they can get around or try and get around the, um, the, the court oversight. Now, that saddens me immensely, and it's something that judges in my division are faced with on a daily basis. When I say to counsel, why do you not want my, my approval of the settlement? And he says to me, we just don't, because we know that you've got concerns about it. And we don't want your concerns to come into the mix. And the RAF is not represented. So, so what does a judge do under those circumstances? Commissioner, you can do one of two things. And judges do one of two things. You can say, all right, have it your way. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you say that you've settled, you say that these irregularities are not something that I should, um, that I should cast my eye over. And that, that is the sort of thing that happens every day. Or you say, I can't look away. I have, an, I have a duty of oversight. I cannot look away from this. And that's what Taylor was, I explained exactly what was happening on a, on a grand scale. When an attorney says to me, our new policy, when, when, when an attorney of the, of the stature of de Broglio says to me, um, our new policy is not to enter into um, contingency fee agreements with clients. I find that an absolutely astonishing proposition. Because at um, very least it's in fraudum legis. I, I know that the, this might be a matter that uh, needs to be dealt with, but we there are time constraints. I so, understand that. But so we need to have finality on it so that we can move on. So, so the short matters. answer, if I, can, if I can give the short answer to, 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 to put a stop to it. I did hear them. I heard them over three days. I told them what my concerns were. Instead of addressing the concerns, they said I had no jurisdiction. Um, and you ask what can be done. There needs to be more transparency. There needs to... 
judges, judges are now in the predicament where they have to fight the corner of the defendant because there's no, there's no defense counsel. So when a judge um, has difficulties with, 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 with the evidence, there's nobody to, to put forward that part of the case. And literally millions, millions and millions are being irregularly spent. And the RAF is bankrupt. And that's okay. what Taylor was about. Okay, thank you, thank you, CJ. I think this matter can... I just wanted to find out, lastly, did you report this to the LPC? Um, I reported it to the LPC, mm -hmm. to the LPC, because it needs to be investigated. When an attorney says to me, I am circumventing the, the trial process, um, and I'm going to come and amend my particulars of claim. Uh, Judge Fisher, do you need to explain? She asked, did you report it to... I, I reported it to the LPC. Did, yeah. I okay. reported it for, for investigation to the LPC. Okay, all right. Uh, Minister, you are next. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Judge. Uh, Hello. Yeah, I'm evening, just uh, on this uh, uh, issue of the interpretation yes. on the uh, matter that was overturned by the Concord. Yes. Uh, and um, I hear that you say it, the, the section was a bit uh, ambiguous or some ambiguity, there could be different interpretation. Yes. But as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm just wondering how could the, yourself and the other two senior judges came to the wrong conclusion on the issue of um, the reinstatement of the matter? Because... Uh, a basic um, practical thing for the matter. I mean, if a criminal, for example, with a criminal matter, if it's withdrawn, it's not final. So I'm just thinking at a basic level, what could have went wrong that um, led to this interpretation that the Concord ended up over overtaking? Because um, from where I'm sitting, the first interpretation would have been this could be indeed reinstated uh, when you read and interpret the section correctly. Um, if you read the judgment, you will show that it, you, you will see that it's a complex argument in relation to the, quin the, the principle of um, of whether somebody has a right after they have either been acquitted or convicted to, to say that I, I cannot be tried again. Now, because there's a criminal component to the provision, um, the argument was that um, that meant that it's not a withdrawal, it was a termination of the matter. Um, so it wasn't just a withdrawal and a reinstatement. It was a, um, it, 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 it was, the matter had come to an end, in fact. And that is why, on the jurisprudence, I looked at American jurisprudence, I looked at English jurisprudence, you'll see. Um, and on that jurisprudence, we came to the, the conclusion that it would be contrary to the rights um, of the, the person to, to be brought back when, um, when there had been a, um, a decision made in the matter, because th that's essentially what it boiled down to, that there had been a decision made in the matter, a decision not to proceed. Now, you will know that in, um, in a criminal court, um, a decision such as that allows the, um, allows the accused to plead, um, I have been acquitted, or I have been, um, or I have, um, I, I can't be, be tried again. So I've been convicted, 
or I've been acquitted. And now you can't come back again in the interests of finality. And Minister, that was really the, the, um, the difference in the interpretation, whether the commission should, should, should be entitled to, to simply with, withdraw the matter and then decide to come back again whenever it liked. Um, or whether it would be better if it had those powers. So, so it was a human, it, 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 it was a constitutional weighing up of which of the rights should take precedence. And we said, um, because of the criminal nature, you have a right to finality um, as an accused person, because um, as, a, as a person who's brought before the commission, you're in a similar position to an accused person. Uh, okay, thank you. The, the other issue I wanted to ask you about is the, the criticism um, of the Competitions Appeals Court that it is lenient on um, excessive pricing matters and uh, also predatory pricing. The Sasol matter, which uh, comes to where the they overturned both decisions of the competition tribunal. What will be your view to, to, to that criticism and what will be your role going forward in that regard, uh, also in line with the question that the Commissioner Madonsala asked about the transformatory impact of the Competitions Act? Well, I think that the court has got to look at the purpose of the act which is very specifically designed to, to um, right the wrongs. So I think being um, light on predatory pricing, um, in some of the decisions, it's gone the other way, like in Media 24, for example, um, in, 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 in that matter. And in, in, in relation to, to um, CompuTicket to, to, to a large extent as well. So I don't think it's necessarily um, lenient across the board. Um, but predatory pricing for me is such an interesting concept because it, you know, the, the thought that you can, by lowering your prices, you can be anti-competitive is, is quite a, it's a fascinating um, inquiry. Um, and I, I think Media 24 was a, was a particularly interesting matter, and there were a number of very fine judgments given um, in, in Media 24. Um, and um, so, so, yes, I, I, I think that there does have to be um, a slant towards protecting the... Um, the, the, the economy and, and protecting the rights of consumers and um, the, the rights of the smaller man in, um, in, the, in the industry. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh, and thank you, Sujay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I would be very glad if the next two colleagues are able to announce that they will uh, have one question only. And I think the president of the SA has indicated, President Meyer. Thank you, ECJ. Um, good evening, Judge Fisher. Good evening, President Meyer. Quick one for me. Uh, I just want you to explain a seemingly random word uh, in your application form, and you'll tell me if I'm being unduly finicky. At page 10, the para 16.4 of your application form, you mention the Atlantis property holdings judgment. And then there's um, commentary within brackets where you say full court dash lengthy dissenting judgment of Valley J. I was just struck by the word lengthy, I, I guess I'm I'm very sensitive, maybe. But wh wh what prompted that description? It, it almost sounds like criticism to me. Um, 
That is a judgment that I think Judge Valley raised in relation to the um, the his his commentary on the on, on the contractual aspects, the con constitutional um, contractual aspects. It was a fascinating case in the sense that, on the face of it, the interpretation was such that um, it was significant. It, it seemed a significant, a significantly unjust. Um, agreement. It seemed an untenable agreement to me um, in relation to, to lease. Um, Judge Valley was also of the view that it was, it was untenable. Um, and he wrote, a, he, he wrote a dissenting judgment dealing with, um, with constitutional aspects. Um, and it was very lengthy. So I... I, I don't know why I mentioned that it was lengthy, but it is, it's, it, it's very lengthy and very um, in-depth. Thank you, President Meyer. Judge President Lambo. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Acting Chief Justice. Judge Fisher. Yes. In yes. a very short, direct manner, um, can you explain why? it is a problem for a judge to rubber stamp a settlement agreement. This is what happened in Taylor, or what was desired in Taylor. That was what was desired in Taylor. As, as you know, JP, it's what's desired every day on a grand scale in our courts. And the fact is that um, it leaves scope for corruption. It leaves scope for... for um, um, incompetence, because if judges don't have oversight, then you've just got two parties getting together um, and deciding on, on, on what they're going to settle with. Um, and these are public funds. My attitude to public funds is that I treat them as if they were, they're my own funds. But often RAF um, practitioners don't have the level of expertise of perhaps plaintiff's counsel who, of, of, who, who's been around the block many times. And um, Can I just stop remember, you there? Just remember, Judge Fisher, that Judge President Lambo asked you to give him a direct yeah. answer. You, sorry, uh, Chief Justice, I just need to clarify this with two short questions. One is you yeah. say... RAF practitioners are not so experienced. Do you mean claims handlers? I mean the claims handlers. Yes, because the RAF, as a litigant opposing this litigation, is absent. Completely absent. So, so the court has to lend its expertise. And if the court is told, sorry, notwithstanding the fact that you don't like what you see here, okay. we've settled, yeah. you must go away, well, I think that that is problematic. And as I said, the contingency Judge Fischer, fee... Judge let me stop you there. Yeah. My last question is, do we have cases where these highly inflated claims have been found by judges and struck down in the division? A number. Thank you, Acting Chief Justice. Thank you. Um, our, the commissioners on virtual, I forgot about you. I hope that you are covered. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Commissioner Singh? Is Commissioner Barnett? Commissioner Barnett? Did you say you are fine? Uh, the, uh, with your permission, I'd like to just explore one or two of these aspects further with the um, judge. Okay, we are at ten past ten. I, I, I know I'm, I'm not saying prep. don't do it. I just want you to be aware of, of the time. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to. Uh, good evening, Judge. Um, I, I want to come at uh, it from a different angle and just talk about the plight of the suffering plaintiffs in the. Tonsi and the Taylor matters. Um, you know, if one has to compare the, the plaintiff that has been uh, injured in, in an accident uh, compared to the road accident fund on the other side, 
I would put it to you that the plaintiff is the one that is in dire need of assistance. Would you agree? I agree. Uh, and yet, you, when you defend it, uh, you, your approach, you, you then say that you, you, you need to fight for in the corner of the defendant. So my, my question is really on open-mindedness and sense of fairness. And the question is this, is in what, in what way did this judgment and approach of yours assist Mr. Taylor, who seems to be lodging, uh, or, or also seems to be um, lodging an objection? Um, well, it's, it's Mrs. Taylor, and um, the approach taken by the, um, the practitioners did not assist Mrs. Taylor because they infl inflated the amount threefold. Um, the, the, the settlement is irregular. To the extent that it is irregular, this creates a difficulty for plaintiffs in, in the position of, uh, of Mrs. Taylor because she, um, she then has a, um, a settlement agreement which um, is subject to attack. Whereas if the settlement was struck in a proper, transparent way with a, with, with the judge's oversight, signing off on the agreement, Mrs. Taylor would not be put in that predicament. It's not the court that put Ms. Mrs. Taylor in the predicament. It's, it's the attorneys who overreached and put Mrs. Taylor in that predicament. And it's a very, very sad state of affairs. The, 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 the writing the Taylor Matonzi judgment. Sorry, sorry, can I, can I, I, I take the point, sorry to interrupt you, but in, she says specifically that Judge Fisher made credibility findings against me. I did so she feels aggrieved because she says that without hearing her, without hearing evidence, you made finding of, of on credibility side so the, my, I put it to you that perhaps with and I, I take it that there's a mischief that the court has a duty to address um, and that there's, a, there, there's been circulars and, and so on and discussions in the court and directives from the judge president that, 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 that I understand but it seems to me that that does in a sense perhaps I put it to you well let me ask it in the form of a question does that not in a sense compromise uh, did that not in this matter maybe compromise your sense of open-mindedness and fairness that you did perhaps lean over too far in, 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 and, and didn't strike a, a proper balance here between the suffering plaintiff on the one side um, and, and um, the mischief that was not really directly before the court in this sense, uh, you know, the, 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 there was no evidence led of, of that in, at least as, as far as I understand it. Um. All the facts, there was no dispute in the matter. So all the facts emerged from the record. They emerged from the, um, the expert reports that were rel relied upon by the plaintiff. So to suggest that a credibility finding is made when there's no factual dispute is entirely incorrect. I made no credibility finding against um, Mrs. Taylor. But I did state that the manner in which the legal practitioners fought her case for her was detrimental to her and, and of great concern to me because this is happening across the board. And, um, and plaintiffs, the, the, the vulnerable people are the victims. They're not getting paid. Uh. Judge Fisher, you have indicated that you didn't make any credibility findings against her. Uh, uh, I guess that, that that's your answer, really. That's my answer. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. What, what, was, there, was, there, uh, was there evidence led regarding the attorneys then that were involved in that matter? Because you, you, you said earlier that you found astonishing the, the position that the attorneys took. So I, I take it that you had something that you based that on. Yes. Um, the matter unfolded in front of me. So um, there was no dispute that there was a proposal that had been made to the RAF, which was significantly inflated. And I said, I'm concerned about this. Um, 
they were, there was no concern, there was, there, there was no dispute about the, um, about the authors of the proposal. There was no dispute about the fact that there was an error made. The council involved said, oh yes, I actually made an error. Well, he also told me that he was prepared for the trial and that he was about to run it. So to say that he'd made an error, um, I accept that people make errors, but if one looks at the, at at, at the facts as they emerge. And I've set the facts out very, very carefully in my judgment, Mr. Barnard. I'm sure, I'm sure you've read it. That's great. And I'm sure you've seen that I've set them out at great length in an unopposed application. And I'm, I'm sorry, Judge Fisher. I may have misunderstood the question, but I thought the question was simply whether there was evidence led before you in relation to the attorneys. They didn't need to be evidence led because, because what, what was happening was happening in front of me. It was in my court. Mm. So I said, what about this proposal? It's, it, it, it's, got, false, it's got, got false facts in it. And they said, oh, well, yes, we, we, we made, um, we, we made a, um, a mistake in relation to, to, to certain of the aspects. Um, and then I say, well, what about this? What about this actuarial sum? Because there's a mistake in this as well. And on what basis have you amended the, um, the particulars of claim? Threefold, from one million to three million, um, a matter of days before the trial. On what, on what basis have you done? That was the evidence. It wasn't in dispute that that was being done. What was said is, yes, We've done that, and we've settled, and thank you very much, but we don't need the court's imprimatur. In fact, we do need it, but we don't want it. Are you covered now, <coughs> Commissioner Bernard? Uh, uh, not, not quite, Chair. I just want to just quite, um, touch on the aspect of the contingency fee agreement that was spoken about earlier. It, it, it would seem it would seem to from what um, judge what you've said is that there was in fact uh, the the what was said to you by the practitioners was there was not a contingency fee agreement in this in this instance yes and 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 uh, and you say that you found that astonishing did you um uh, what do you base that finding on look i would have to go into the whole contingency fee um act and what it requires but before, no, but, but, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but the, the point is there, there was not a, um, I think the, the point was made by you that they said this is not a contingency fee agreement, because I think you, you, you said that they indicated it was their policy not to no longer conclude contingency fee agreements. Yes. And um, so, so my question is, you, you didn't have any evidence of a contingency fee agreement, and yet it seems you still, you still seem to take the position that that is a contingency fee agreement which was open to the court to, to have a look at. And once again, if, if it was a contingency fee agreement, there's no nothing wrong with the court trying to investigate and, and trying to uncover mischief and so on. I think that's a duty. But in this case, when you don't have that evidence before you and you still proceed along those lines, um, do you think that is a, a sense of open-mindedness sufficient that is suspect, uh, expected of a, a judge? I'm sorry, your fee. voice says... I had, I had the con contingency fee. I, I had the agreements in front of me. They were not, um, they were said not to be contingency fee agreements, but the RAF is a contingency fee environment. So it's a very, very unusual circumstance for um, attorneys not to conclude contingency fee agreements with, I, I, with their clients. And the only reason they do it is, is so that they can avoid the judicial oversight that the Act prescribes. I, I, I disagree with you, uh, Judge, and I must put it to you because I think that's where the, the question on the open-mindedness comes from. There are many claims that are put in against the Road Accident Fund that are represented, where clients are represented by attorneys, and the attorneys are not acting on contingency fees. And so, my, my, once again, the question is, if, if, if that's not before you, 
Um, I'm asking whether your open-mindedness was not clouded by, could not easily be clouded by the, you know, there's a lot of uh, noise or a lot of input in the background or uh, extraneous from this matter that might have influenced you. No. Um, when one looks at contingency fee agreements, the payment has got to go to the attorney from somewhere, Mr. Barnard. And where does that payment come from? It comes from the capital payout. Mrs. Taylor was an in indigent woman. The only way that de Broglio would be paid is out of the capital that she received. Now, you tell me that that is not a contingency arrangement on the face of it. Just because you, you, you say something is not a contingency fee agreement does not mean that it's not a contingency fee agreement because, because it has all the hallmarks of contingency. Because otherwise, if you don't succeed, you don't get paid. Are there any circumstances uh, in terms of... Uh, can, 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 I, can I stop you now? Co Commissioner, Commissioner Barnard, can I stop yes, you now? Um, you remember fine, the I agreement is two, two questions. I've given you some leeway, uh, I, so uh, it, it would not be right to just continue. I thank you, Judge. Thank you. Yes. I, I take it that there is no further question. Let's stop, let's stop here. Uh, just one issue, uh, Judge Fisher. Section 36 of the Competition Act says uh, a judge of the Competition Appeal Court must be committed to the purposes and principles mentioned in Section 2 of, the, of that Act. Yes. Are you committed to those purposes and principles? I am, to promote uh, efficiency. And you to, know them. And I know them all. I yes. know them all. And I am committed to them. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, let's uh, end it here. Oh, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, all right. We have come to the end of this interview, Judge Fisher. Thank you very much for availing yourself. Once again, I apologize that we have kept you until so late. But um, it was necessary that we do the best we can to make sure that the interview is done properly. Yes. Thank you very much. You are now excused. Thank you, and good night, everybody. Thank you.